Well, I'm sure that uh, some of you guys tonight will be old enough to remember a TV program called Tomorrow's World. Tomorrow's World. Some one or two people nodding. And um, it was a bit of a, a 1980s, 1990s uh, classic. And um, it was a program that gave people a glimpse of the future. They had all kinds of gadgets on Tomorrow's World. Um, and often as they tried to predict the future, they got things right. Um, often they got things wrong. And uh, this past week, I watched uh, a little bit of an episode uh, on YouTube. It was 1991. And uh, the presenter had one of the first ever digital organizers uh, with a touch screen, with a pen, that kind of thing. It was very big. It was very slow. And uh, she couldn't quite believe that um, she was saying that people in the future would use these kinds of things um, as part of their daily lives. But uh, she was right, wasn't she? And in our passage uh, tonight, Paul um, has his eyes on the future. He wants his readers and he wants all of us to press on as Christians. He wants us not to give up. And there are four things that I want to uh, show us in this passage tonight, four headings uh, as we look at it together. First, in verses 12 to 14, Paul says, look ahead, look ahead. Not that I've already obtained this or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own. In these verses, Paul is aiming for a prize, a goal. He has his eyes fixed on the future we thought about last week, the resurrection of the dead. And running a race is a a metaphor that is used throughout the Bible. But notice as we begin, and Stephen brought this out in his prayer, notice as we begin what qualifies Paul for this race. He is pressing on to make it his own because, verse 12, Christ Jesus has made me his own. Uh, This is the language of ownership. Paul is reminding us that as Christians, we belong to Jesus Christ. He chose us. He began a good work in us, a work of his grace. So Paul isn't running to earn God's approval. No, he runs from a place of security. He's united to Jesus. But Paul is also not super spiritual. He doesn't suffer from Christian perfectionism. He knows he has not yet arrived, and so he keeps on running. And as he runs, notice verse 13, that he refuses to look back. Now, uh, when I read that, I couldn't help thinking of the film Forrest Gump, Run, Forrest, Run. It's a great image. And I think we can apply it in two ways. When Paul says he forgets what lies behind, he means that he's not dwelling on past failures or living off past success. Not dwelling on on past failures or living off past success. See, before he came to Christ, Paul persecuted Christians. He was full of pride And don't you think the devil must have brought all that up so often? Tried to make him wallow in his failures. Dig up sins that had been dealt with and forgiven. The devil loves to do that. The devil is an accuser. He loves to paralyze Christians by reminding us of past mistakes. Maybe tonight he's doing that to you. Friend, you are still in the race. Don't give up. Keep running. Or maybe tonight we're facing the opposite challenge. In his book, Traveling Hopefully, Bob File, a friend of mine, he tells the story of a man who had a very moving testimony. Um, He was the kind of guy who was always asked to share this testimony in public, 
But as he did, people started to notice that he always used exactly the same phrases, exactly the same words every single time. He had a set of yellowed, dog-eared notes. And one day, before he was preparing uh, to speak, he was frantically searching for them in a chest of drawers, when all of a sudden, his wife, he called out to his wife, the mice have eaten my testimony. The mice have eaten my testimony. Now, it's, it's a funny story, but it's a very powerful point, isn't it? Is that us? Is God's work all in the past? Do we look back on periods of our Christian lives as the good old days? Or are we still looking to the future? Do we still want to grow? Are we straining forward? Thankful for all God's done in our lives, but still following Jesus today. Friends, let's follow Paul and forget what lies behind. One of my favorite illustrations of this um, is in Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, In that chapter, uh, the writer recounts all the stories of the heroes of faith, Old Testament believers who lived with their eyes on the future. And I think verses 13 to 16 of Hebrews 11, they are some of my favorite verses in the Bible. They, They kind of sum up the whole chapter. All these people Uh, the author writes, were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They were longing for a better country. God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Friends, let's follow that example. Let's follow Paul's. Let's look ahead. And speaking of examples, secondly, let's look around. Look around. This is verses 15 to 17. Look around. In these verses, the emphasis is on imitation and example. Can you see that as you look down at the text? As he encourages his readers to press on, Paul reminds them that they're not running alone. Look around, he says. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also. Keep your eyes on the example of others. Now, what's fascinating here is that on the one hand, Paul makes clear he has unique authority. So in verse 15, he is, he's writing as an apostle. He's been commissioned by Christ. So he can write... What I say is a mark of maturity, is a mark of maturity. He can say, if you think otherwise, God will make things clear to you. And yet, he isn't throwing his weight around. Do you see how verse 17 begins? He's talking to his brothers, his sisters. Not only that, look at verse 16. It's not... Make sure you hold true, it's let us hold true. Paul is not standing on a pedestal. He is not berating the Philippians or telling them to do something he's not doing himself. Instead, I think in these verses, what is being stressed here is the power of example in the Christian life. Paul is calling his friends to follow those who, like him, walk a particular way. Now, you and I, we need role models in life, don't we? We need them at work. Uh, Maybe someone who uh, we can look up to who's done the job for a few more years than us. We need, need them in family life, older people who've kind of seen it all before. And we need them as we follow Jesus. We need people to look up to, examples. And I'm sure as I I say that, you can think of people who've been that to you, maybe parents or, or friends or other people. And Paul had already given the Philippians two examples in chapter two, Timothy and Epaphroditus. They were men who lived the life he describes in this passage. They weren't perfect, but they were good examples. 
And this is also important because the Christian life is a pilgrimage. But it is not a pilgrimage that we walk on our own. No, we need others and others need us. In uh, 2016, Alistair Brownlee, he gave up the chance to win the World Triathlon uh, Series in Mexico. Because as he approached the the home straight, he saw his, his brother Johnny weaving all over the place. He was completely exhausted. Alistair ran up to him, put his arm around him over his shoulder. He carried him to the finishing line. It's a a wonderful um, picture of the Christian life. And maybe tonight you, you know someone or you are someone who is just beginning the Christian life. Well, never think, never think that you have to go it alone. God has not designed the Christian life to be lived that way. If we can uh, mix our metaphors, it is a race, but it is also a team sport. And if you're new here, then know that as you take your place in in this church family, you will receive from others and encourage others too. You see, what do you think of, what do I think of when we hear the phrase, a mature Christian? You know, do we think of someone with their head in the clouds, someone who never seems to sin or struggle, someone just above all of that, someone who never needs others? Well, that is not what Paul thinks. No, he says that the mark of maturity is to know you have not yet arrived. It is not living for Jesus all by yourself. No, a mature Christian is someone who follows the example of Paul and his friends. So look ahead. Look around. Thirdly, verses 18 to 19, look out, look out. In 18 and 19, Paul gives us another example, but it is not um, a positive one, it's a negative one. Because here he mentions people who will try to stop his readers from running the race, from keeping going. And negative examples can be very helpful, can't they? From time to time, um, drugs, cheats uh, get unmasked, don't they, in sport, that kind of thing. Maybe especially in athletics. And what does that do to the person who competes the right way? Well, maybe to begin, it makes them very angry, but it also strengthens their resolve, doesn't it? It shows up the folly of cheating. And it's a bit like that here. Paul mentions those who walk as enemies of the cross, enemies of the cross. It's a very powerful phrase, isn't it? In case we ever think of Paul as a bit cold or or distant, he Notice, speaks about these people with tears. But how is their hostility to the cross seen? Well, look at verse 19. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. And they glory in their shame. And I think the last phrase captures it in a nutshell. With mindset on earthly things. Um, A few weeks ago, I mentioned that there are two ways that we can walk away from Jesus. One is legalism. This is what Paul was countering earlier in the chapter. It's what we, when we try to add good works or, or religious practices to what Jesus has done. It's when we try to justify ourselves before God or before others. But do you remember the other path away from Jesus? It begins with the letter L as well. It is license. License. That is what Paul is showing us here in verses 18 and 19. License says, God loves you. Jesus died for you. So you can just live as you please. You don't have to take up your cross. 
you don't have to deny yourself. You don't really even have to follow Jesus. But Paul says that is folly. And Paul says that is the path that leads to destruction. Now, what's interesting is that Paul doesn't give um, specific examples in verses 18 and 19. Instead, he uses a, a very vivid illustration. Their God is their belly. Their God is their belly. It's quite a thought, isn't it? Um, as Alec Mateer, a uh, commentator, puts it, these people recognize no need and no authority outside personal satisfaction. No need and no authority outside personal satisfaction. They glory in their shame. Now, as we hear that, you and I will know that we have all done things we are ashamed of. But Paul is not talking here about the Christian with a sensitive conscience. He is not trying to crush a person like that, a person who runs to Jesus when they sin. Christ has a tender heart towards us if we're like that tonight. But Paul is warning us, look at the enemies of the cross and see the irony. They think they're free. They think they're free, but they're just slaves, slaves to their own appetites. Don't be like that, he's saying. Keep pressing on. One of the commentators, very interesting, he points out that Paul uses very similar language to verse 19 in Romans chapter 16, verse 18. There he warns against divisive people, smooth talkers, those who flatter and deceive. He says they are not serving our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. That's the distinction, isn't it? That's the choice. That's what it means to be a disciple. Christ's way over my way. Do you see how this clashes so much with our culture? Because our culture today believes passionately in personal freedom. Many people think that in order to be our true selves, we need freedom from all kinds of restraints. We, we don't like being told how to live. And often as Christians, we can be very tempted by this kind of thinking. Wouldn't life be better, easier, if I didn't have to obey Christ's teaching in area A, B, or C? But think of a train. A train needs tracks. A train needs tracks if it's going to go anywhere. It needs to be restrained. It needs to be directed. Or what about a fish? When is a fish most free? Out of the water or in the water? Paul wants us to realize, as the book of Common Prayer puts it so memorably, that God's service is perfect freedom. God's service is perfect freedom. That is the paradox of the Christian life. I am not my own, and I am most free when I am Christ's. That can be a very painful lesson for us to learn, but it is still true. Look ahead, look around, look out. Lastly, verses 20 to 21 Look up. Look up. In these verses, Paul reminds us of our destiny as believers. He wants us to keep running with the future firmly in view. Our end is not destruction. That's what he's saying to you tonight if you're a Christian. Our end is not destruction, but our citizenship is in heaven. 
Now, to be a citizen is to belong, isn't it? It's to have certain rights and responsibilities. And we've got them uh, now with uh, Dundee Council. All kinds of rights and responsibilities. The Philippians were proud to, to live in a Roman colony. But Paul wants them to remember the better country that I mentioned earlier on. I think it's really important, though, to add that our hope as Christians is not to escape this world. Look what Paul says. Our citizenship is in heaven, and we await a Savior from there, from there. So the Christian's ultimate hope is not that we go to him, but that he one day comes to us. If we die before his return, we will, as Paul says in Philippians chapter 1, be with Christ. That's a great comfort, isn't it, to us, especially as we think of people we love who are there just now. But it's not our final state. You see, remember Revelation 21. What does John see? Heaven coming down to earth. The holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It's not that we go up, but that heaven comes down. And the American poet Robert Frost, he described um, home as the place where when you have to go there, they have to take you in. But the new creation, it's even better than that. And um, I think I've quoted <clears throat> C.S. Lewis in just about every sermon I've preached here, uh, but no one puts this better than him. At the end of uh, the Narnia stories, one of the characters says, I have come home at last. This is my real country. I belong here. This is the land I've been looking for all my life, though I never knew it till now. That is what we will feel like one day. We have a future as Christians, and it is a bodily future. It is a bodily future. When Christ returns, our lowly bodies, do you see that in verse 21, will be like his glorious body. See, our bodies are lowly, aren't they? We all have limits. We all get tired. We all get old. We all get sick. We all get stressed. But the Christian hope is not that we abandon our bodies, that we float on clouds and play the harp forever. No, the Christian hope is that one day you and I will have resurrection bodies. Resurrection bodies. And it was always going to be this way. At the incarnation, God the Son added a human nature to his divine nature. But it wasn't just that he had a body for 33 years. You see, look at verse 21 again. We see the words glorious body and we probably focus on the first word. But Jesus still has a body. At the incarnation, God the Son made the commitment to have a body for good. He did it to save us. And one day he will transform our lowly bodies to be like his. Paul describes this wonderful day in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, Adam, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. One a hymn writer puts it incredibly vividly, imagining 
um, this day. O oh, resurrection body, young, radiant, vibrant, free, with powers unthought, undreamed of, how rich your joys will be through endless years to marvel, design, create, explore, in resurrection wonder, to worship, serve, adore. That is our future. That is our future. Uh, George Mallory and Andrew Irvin, they are often considered um, the first men to have reached the top of Everest. And during their 1924 expedition, almost 30 years before it was officially climbed, they disappeared from sight um, on the northeast ridge of Everest, and they never came home. And it was famously said that they were last seen heading for the summit. Last seen heading for the summit. It's a great phrase, isn't it? It's a great motto for the Christian life. Last seen heading for the summit. And I think Paul would like it, wouldn't he? So let's pray for God's help now to press on like that. Let's pray.